Добрый день, шановные гости, добрый день, шановные панелисты. Good evening, good evening, dear guests, dear panelists. I'm pleased to welcome you all here in this room, and I'm also really grateful to all of those people who have survived throughout all of our sessions and got to our session because we're going to be discussing a very important issue today, the issue of security, not also of Crimea, but the overall broader context of the Black Sea and as a region. I uh, welcome everybody, all night old, here on this session, and um, uh, welcome everybody who is still alive and who is keeping shape, because we will speak about very important issues. We will speak about security of Black Sea and Azov Sea region. And now, short introduction, video introduction, to give you the feeling of what's going on. Rolik Budlaska. August 24, 1991, Ukraine declares its independence. 23 years later, Russian Federation initiates acts of aggression against Ukraine. In total disregard of the norms and principles of international law, Russia tries to annex the Crimean Peninsula. More than 45,000 citizens are forced to flee the peninsula due to personal safety risks and barbaric oppression of human rights. Mass persecution of Crimean Tatars arise. The Majlis is being banned. The first year of occupation ends with the nationalization of Ukraine defense industry. The second year is marked by the beginning of illegal construction of a bridge across the Kerch Strait, which connects Russia with the occupied territory. Russian Federation adopts a maritime strategy, which implies strengthening of the occupying forces. Three Ukrainian Navy vessels are captured by Russia near the Kerch Strait. A bridge across the Kerch Strait is opened. The ecology of the Sea of Azov is under threat. Russia demonstrates its strength by starting a war game in Crimea. Under the guise of military exercise, Russian Federation blocks the entrance to the Kerch Strait, curtailing freedom of navigation. Russia's forces on the peninsula continue to grow despite concerns voiced by the international community. Would-be nuclear weapons are being deployed. Nuclear infrastructure is being actively restored and developed, along with mass migration of Russians to the occupied territories. Seven years, six months, and three days ago, the world has changed. Russia has shattered the rule-based international order. Ukraine is not the only one who ended up in danger, as Russia keeps posing new threats to the world. Until the deoccupation of Crimea takes place, the rules of civilized community of the European continent will not be restored, and the world will continue to be under threat of potential attack. Enough with the talk. Take action. So indeed, we are talking about not only Crimea, we are talking about not only militarization of the region, we are saying about the threat to much higher uh, uh, region, uh, which includes not only Mediterranean or Baltics, because the bad behavior uh, gives the wrong examples for other nations and uh, harms international based order. And I would like to introduce to you distinguished speakers which are here on this panel with me. Alexei Danilov, uh, Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. Mircea Joanna, NATO Deputy Secretary General. Jeremy Quinn, Minister of, Minister of State, uh, Minister for Defense Procurement, UK. Peter Hulquist, Minister uh, of Defense of Sweden. Kalle Laanet, Minister of Defense of Estonia, and Volodymyr Griska, who represented here the expert network of Crimean platform and is a Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ukraine in 2007-2009. So um, I would like to start this uh, set of questions from the, uh, you understand how the black and us of sea security influence the global security. And my first question will be to Pana Danilova. 
Uh, I would like to start with this question to Mr. Danilo first of all, because Ukraine unfortunately is not yet the country that plays the most important role at the international arena, but we definitely influence in the agenda, especially in the questions of defense and security. So do you believe that we can change the situation and that we can bring our, our, our agenda as well, that we can bring our issues on the international agenda? What is the role of Crimean platform to building up the new agenda in the region in the, in the more broader space? Uh, thank you very much for your question, but I would like to start with a slightly different point of view, because today in this room we have already had a very important event taking place. We have had the summit, the first summit, the inaugural summit of Crimean platform. And at this summit we've had multiple speakers and different representatives of nations and states. We have the opportunity to express the points of view that have been going on in the world today. But we had the final presentation during the summit, the final presentation at the summit that has given us the overall outline and understanding of what is going on. We've had the speech by Mustafa Jamilev, a legendary man, a legendary man who might not be tall enough, but who has the broadness of his heart. The person that has been born in 1943 in Crimea, the person that has been deported from Crimea in 1944 by Stalin, the person who has been born uh, during the occupation in 1944 together with his family, he was forced to be displaced to Uzbekistan. Mustafa Jamilov, the person who has been imprisoned by the Soviet regime for multiple years in 1968, when the Soviet tanks have been in Prague. This person has stood up for the honor of the Czech Republic. He, just one man, has stood up to protect democracy. When in 2014, Mr. Putin has already started the third wave of deportation, and that was the third time that Mustafa Jamilov has been deported from his land, from Crimea, no one stood on his behalf and no one stood to his defense. It is really terrible for us to see those stories going on in 21st century, and we're going to be discussing it today. What should we do and in what way we should be moving further on to improve the situation? But I might say, if we will not take actions, then we will see the continuation of everything that we have seen before. I'm not speaking about action of military nature, of not speaking about military actions in no way. For example, on the 21st of June in Odessa, we've seen one of the, one of the vessels from the UK with a great title. Defender. So we have seen the defender then. And when the defender has been to Ukrainian basins, to Ukrainian water, and when it has been going to Georgia, Russia has been nervous. It was just the moment of a simple trip. If we will not take actions, dear friends, we can do summits, we can take a lot of conversations, but there will be no overall improvement over the situations that we currently see in the world. And we will still see again. The situation when the Crimean Tatars are deprived of the right to live at their own land, to be developing their community, to educate their children there. And this is a terrible situation for the 21st century. It has been an interesting discussion, an interesting presentation when the representative of Czech Republic has mentioned that the head of Senate of Czech Republic has been participating in the summit in the morning. He mentioned Stalin and Hitler. There's something like that is something similar is going on right now, but the world is silent. The world is silent while we are being here. And we have to acknowledge now, when are they, we speaking of money or are we speaking of human rights, of democracy, of the rights that have to be the same to all of the people all over the world right now. One country cannot behave as they want to and pay no responsibility of those actions. Moreover, when Ukraine is being targeted to the different institutions of the European Union, we might look weird. But getting back to your question, I think that we can have a really long discussions, and we've had this discussion with 
with the deputy of um, the Secretary General of the Northern Alliance, and we've had a very good, productive meeting there. We understand that we have to deal with the issues of securities in the basins, but we have to have a clearer understanding that there have to follow the common rules. There cannot be separate rules for separate countries. Thank you. Joanna, talking about actions, we know that um, there were some kind of periods when the uh, focus of NATO was out of the Black and Dissolved Sea region. And we know that now you have a developing of new strategy for NATO for the next decade. So uh, will we see any transformation of security approach in this? Uh, or NATO plan to focus on their traditional regions? And what about the future from your, uh, your future attitude? What discussions you have about the Black Sea uh, security um, for, the, for the next period in Alliance? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm privileged to attend this, this very important event. Thank you for having me. We had an excellent discussion this morning. Listen, the, what happened? in 2014 with the annexation, illegal, immoral, illegitimate annexation of Crimea is not only about Ukraine. I would dare to say it's not even only about the Black Sea region. It's about the architecture of the system of norms and rules in the world. This is why this topic is so sensitive and so emotional indeed for the people of Ukraine, for the Crimean Tatars, for all the people, minorities and others that are suffering there. But it's also a, ma a massive wake-up call for all of us. So in NATO, since 2014, we've done a lot. We've strengthened the eastern flank from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. We created in my home country, Romania, in Craiova, a regional multinational brigade. Allies are air policing as we speak. Our UK allies, our German allies now, our Canadian, our Spanish. Our... If speaking of, of maritime patrolling in the Black Sea, probably we could and we should see probably even more. But today, as we speak, we have massive presence from Allied navies in the Black Sea. Also, we are looking quite carefully, not only to the situation in the Black Sea and the Azov Seas, as complex as they are, but the Russian militarization of Crimea and the buildup is also a massive power projection instrument for a much wider region for the Mediterranean, for the Levant, for many other places. So my answer is very simple. The Black Sea security is paramount for NATO. As it is very important for us to have a 360 degree approach to our security. Because saying that we care about the Black Sea security or the Eastern flank country security doesn't mean that we are not paying similar attention to the Southern flank, to the North, and we have colleagues here coming from the Baltic region and from, from, from Northern Europe, uh, some of them allies, some of them very close partners to NATO, like, like Sweden or Finland. So what we are doing today, we are in the process of a massive transformation of our deterrence and defense posture. As we speak, our political leaders have instructed the Secretary General and us on the way to the Madrid summit to revisit the strategic concept of NATO to look even more attentively to deterrence and defense for all the geographies of NATO territory and all, also the domains. And here I'll make a, a, a final point because there are many speakers you have to, to uh, control and instruct today. This is not only about the geography per se. Modern security and modern warfare is also cross geographies and cross domains. So when we are talking to our friends and learning from our friends from Ukraine and for Georgia for that matter, we are learning in a two-way street effort because you've been unfortunately so much exposed to 
aggression to war from Russia, to hybrid warfare, to cyber attacks. You remember the grid, the attack on the grid in Ukraine a few years ago? It seemed to be an exception. Now it seems to be the norm. So what I'm saying that we take this thing very seriously, more will be done, and together we have to show solidarity uh, and, and, and support for Ukraine and, and, and Georgia. And this is something that also the three literal countries that are NATO members, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and of course Turkey, they're also very important uh, uh, pillars of this Black Sea strategy that we have in NATO. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And really, we do anticipate to see what will be in the strategy. Uh, Mr. Quinn, uh, coming back to the defender, which was mentioned here already a few times, and this innocent passage, which was probably the first so serious uh, demonstration of the protection of freedom of navigation in this region for a long period. Um, what are your plans for the future? What else can be done to demonstrate the support of the community for this uh, keeping the rules? And probably what lessons you learned from other regions where UK is present and where similar threats can be uh, seen or foreseen? Uh, thank you, Lena. I'm delighted to touch on that. Um, but uh, we'll generally just start off to say that it is a great honor to be here representing the UK, to be back in Ukraine. And uh, I think this international crime in platform has a very important role to play. Uh, I, we all very much welcome the initiative. Ukraine is a key partner uh, for the UK, and we are delighted to have been building even stronger links over the last two years, including the bilateral agreement signed between uh, President uh, Zelensky and uh, Prime Minister Johnson last year. We are fully committed to peace and stability in the Black Sea and Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The commitments are absolutely apparent in our recently announced uh, defence review. As a proud maritime nation, and here we get on to Defender, as a proud maritime nation, we have a deep commitment to supporting the United Nations law of the sea and freedom of navigation. This underpins for all of us global trade and all our collective security. It is vital that these rights are protected wherever they are challenged. And indeed, risk becoming challenged or risk coming under threat, whether that's in the South China Sea, in the Black Sea, or indeed in the Arctic. So let's be clear. When HMS Defender attracted a wholly unjustified and inaccurate Russian media storm this summer, she was, as you say, Alina, conducting innocent passage along a recognized international shipping lane. We will continue to support international norms and the laws of the sea. And in doing so, we know we will not be alone. Since 2014, NATO, as my colleague was saying, has upped its presence in the Black Sea. And only last month, Exercise Sea Breeze saw 30 ships as part of a multinational exercise making uh, visible this wide commitment, a deterrent effect reinforcing the international rules-based order which is under such threat. And this is an important point about working together. But fundamentally, we know it in this room, that Russia has no friends. Ukraine has many friends. And it is, uh, and we must all, in doing so, stand together. That's why I welcome this important platform and the international collaboration that it represents. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, to go now to the, you know, that Ukraine is considered like a smaller nation in, in uh, world uh, international politics. And I'd like to also to hear the experience of other nations, which may be not on the top three, but also plays the substantial role in, in international community. Mr. Holquist, let's talk about some kind of strategy. What you can share as a smaller nation? Why are you here? What are your interests in these regions? And do you still believe in all this situation that the smaller nations has can have its representation and voice on the international arena. If you represent a so-called small nation, 
you need to rely on respect for international law and order. That's basic, because that is the only thing we have if we see to rules and regulation on the international arena if we are going to have some sort of civilized world. Now we have a lot of interests and so-called big nations that not respect international law and regulations. And because of that, we have problems. And the fight for respect for international law and regulations is not only about Ukraine. The Crimea platform, from my perspective, is not only about Ukraine. Because if Russia, which they are, are ready to use military power to fulfill political goals, uh, then they do not respect international law and order. And what we see from our perspective in Sweden is um, exercises, last operations in the North Atlantic, when they exercise or operate, cut the line between United States and Europe. We see operations close to the territorial border of the uh, of, uh, United Kingdom. We see activities at the Norwegian coast, the Swedish west coast, and up in the Baltic Sea. And we see also another way of behavior in the Black Sea. So, so we see all this in whole the map. And what we have to do then is to show that we must balance, we must show that we are not, we, we see what's happened. We have a clear eye and we have also experience. And the real experience 2014 is the annexation of Crimea. And then we have had an ongoing conflict war in Ukraine since then. And we must have a sustainable view of this because nothing has changed since 2014. Uh, they try to infiltrate, they try to push, they try to make an impact on different nations. Uh, we must negotiate, we must be wise, we must be constructive. And then the, the, the goal is that Ukraine should back more, they should push back more. That is the message. And that is to be constructive. And I think that that, so, 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 that that sort of constructiveness is not constructive because that is also a step to violate international law and order. If they can do that at one place, they can also do it on another place. Now we have uh, Belarus. They have free military access to that area. Now we have Sapad. The Belarusian troops will be involved in that together with the Russian troops. This will make pressure on, on Ukraine, make pressure on the Baltics. It will have an impact on all our region with Scandinavia. So, so this is the security environment we have to handle now. And what we can do is sustainable and in the long term say that we want respect for international law and orders. We will uphold the, the European Union sanctions. We will exercise together. We will keep up together. We will be together, united. And because of that, it's very important that we have all these countries represented here today, over 40 countries, because that is a security signal that we want something else with the future. We are not satisfied with this mess that they construct for the world just now, because we want a democratic world and we want to live in peace and have respect for the sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you. Really good words. Um, coming back to the sovereignty, what, what else can be made for keeping it and restoring the peace and security in the region? Mr. Larned, Estonia is, of course, one of the most prominent friends of Ukraine, and we appreciate it. And probably you also know the threat much better than our other our partners, because you, we have a common history. Um, but at the same time, you are an NATO nation, and you just see the discussions which happening inside uh, NATO with other nations on security issues. 
So from your opinion, from your side, do you have some recipes for Ukraine where we should be concentrated to make the deoccupation happen and where it should be concentration to make the security restoration happen here? Thank you. <coughs> Dear friends, it's a great pleasure to be here. Today we are celebrating the uh, Ukrainian flag. Tomorrow we are celebrating uh, 30 years from gaining independence. But we have to look also to the history to know what will happen in the future. The 23rd of August is an infamous day in the history of Central and Eastern Europe countries. The so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed in 1939. That allowed Nazi Germany to start World War II and Stalin's Soviet Union to kill and deport millions of people, including Estonians and Ukrainians. Putin's Russia, differently from Gorbachev's Soviet Union, does not wish to condemn this act that is known in the whole world. Quite to the contrary, Russia's State Duma has criminalized even the mentioning of the Soviet-Nazi collaboration. But how to go forward? I believe the only way forward for both Ukraine and its partners is to demonstrate our unity, strength and determination. While Crimea is most likely a long-term issue, Ukraine should not become desperate. History has shown that evil empires ultimately collapse and justice will win. It took Estonia 51 years to restore its independence. The Western non-recognition policy of the occupation and annexation of the Baltic states by the Soviet Union was crucial to our country's legal continuity and liberalization. So our main efforts should be focused on maintaining the issue of Crimea high on the international agenda. Continue the policy of non-recognition, as well as use any non-military means to pressure Russia to, leave, to relieve tensions, for instance, by reinforcing sanctions. Unfortunately, experience shows that meaningful and fruitful dialogue with Russia is possible only in theory, but not in practice, because Russia is not interested in solving conflicts other than on its own terms. The Kremlin is not at all interested in recognizing its wrongdoings and consequently correcting its policies. Ukraine, in order to protect its independence, and preserve its policy of regaining control over eastern Donbas, as well as Crimea, must continue to strengthen democracy and the rule of law. Its economy, armed and security forces, and defense cooperation with NATO and individual partners in the West, any steps that terminate or limit Ukraine's dependence of, on Russia notably in the energy sector, also serve Ukraine's main goal. And finally, Estonia is a strong believer that NATO's door remains open in spite of Russia's aggressiveness. Article 10 of the Washington Treaty of 1949 states very clearly, the parties may, by unanimous agreement, invite any other European state in a position to further the principles of this treaty and to contribute to the security of the North Atlantic area to accede to this treaty. Thank you. Um, Mr. Griska, you are like uh, in this part, uh, they, they have the final words in, in this uh, half of the session. So I'd like to know, you was in official shoes 
some time. Now you're representing the expert community. You're a diplomat. You understand the language of diplomats. Although the defense people are more uh, open-minded, let's say, than usual diplomat, but what our guests didn't say, what did they mean but didn't say about the situation in Black and Azov Sea uh, region? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Alina. I know that you will put this provocative question, but I would try to, to, to answer this. But probably allow me first uh, to thank, uh, first of all, Ukrainian authorities who invited me as an independent expert and uh, representative of the civil society to take part in this event. <clears throat> in my view, it is a very good sign that we are building really a democratic uh, Ukrainian society. Because civil society is um, is in fact very strong now in Ukraine, and we are ready to help uh, the authorities uh, by all possible means. So thank you again. Secondly, I'd like to thank uh, all participants, uh, especially our NATO colleagues, because it's a real sign of solidarity and support for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I uh, think that uh, it is absolutely important to show the profile today. And uh, I can you very frankly that uh, uh, we have already success, and I uh, think uh, the best uh, proof for that is uh, the very nervous reaction from Moscow. You know that the Minister uh, for Russian Propaganda now uh, called Minister of Foreign Affairs already very um, uh, openly said that this is very anti-Russian gathering in uh, Kyiv. It means we are doing a great job uh, if uh, we have so reaction from, from Moscow. But coming back, uh, Alina, to your question, uh, what I can see as an expert and what our colleagues as official representatives uh, probably cannot say. Uh, I will uh, uh, rearrange this question probably uh, because, in fact, we are talking about the question of uh, the political will, whether we have this political will, whether it is available or not. And after that, we will uh, find very soon very proper words and very, very uh, adequate uh, position. So what I, what I see as an expert, I see that, that strategically NATO has very strong interest in having Ukraine in simply because uh, Ukraine is not a very small country. I would like to uh, remind you that Ukraine is the largest country in Europe, and uh, the question about the Ukraine's security is not about the global level. It is about the, uh, it not, not about the regional level, but it is about the global level. So having, uh, having Ukraine in uh, NATO will uh, dramatically change uh, the global balance of power in favor of, of the alliance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I can also see that uh, NATO, or better to say some NATO member states, are afraid of Russia. Uh, we know these countries, uh, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, so to say, a big secret. But uh, some countries, because of very, I would say, inaccurate assessment of what is going in Russia, still are afraid of Russia. So our Western part uh, partners, unfortunately, also in NATO, are divided. And they, unfortunately, cannot uh, take this very important political decision. Uh, in my view, uh, uh, the fair is not a very good guide for our Western partners. Uh, instead, we should have a uh, very concrete, very deep, very, uh, I would say, uh, all-sided analysis of what is going on in Russia, and do understand that uh, we, civilized part of the world, uh, should have an initiative and should show Russia its place Otherwise, we will lose. I'm sorry for probably for my not very diplomatic uh, formulations, but uh, my understanding is that if we are uh, uh, with our friends, we should communicate directly and openly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next part I would like to dedicate to 
to, to practical steps of uh, uh, the occupation and uh, reintegration of Crimea, because we're talking not about the effect of the occupation, but also reintegration. Mr. Uh, Hulquist, I know you need to go to, for the next meeting, so I would like to address the first question to you. Um, uh, Sweden is known as the country of uh, consensus. I think that this word is one of the uh, most suitable for reintegration process which we need. Ukrainian nations is in many discussion about the uh, different aspects of reintegration, the occupation, how to do it. What you can recommend as a nation which build up its attitude on consensus, how better to deal with such situation? Uh, <clears throat> Thank you for the question. It's very difficult to answer. But uh, in some questions that are very important for all the nation, we try to build a broad majority in our parliament, especially around security and defense questions. And if you have a broad majority in uh, on security and defense, then you also can make a very clear signal to your partners and the countries that you are cooperating with, but also to others that maybe have other ambitions. So they see that there are a body that are sustainable. So, so I think that um, if it's important for the nation, for the country, then you should try to build a broad majority and then maybe also think that we, we need to push down a little about the political conflict, see, it's more, see it as it's more important to be united. And if you are united in some questions, you are stronger. This um, meeting here with over 40 nations and uh, organizations, we are united around this Crimea platform. And because of that, we also can make a, a very clear signal to the world around us. So that shows the strength when you are together. So, so if that is the driving force to build broad majority so you can be strong to your friends, but also be strong to others that have other motives, then you can also be successful in the long run and also have the feeling that my ground position is not, it's not a problem with that. With that. We, can, we can keep up with it for years if you have a solid ground for it. There is no need for a change. For example, it is against the international law. It's uh, wrong. It's not acceptable to have annexation of Crimea. It, it's uh, unacceptable 2014 and it's unacceptable 2024 and 2036. So, so this will not change. It's the same position. And if we see to the Cold War, it was many years with this Berlin Wall and it go away. But we have a Western world that were united in some way and, and keep up with a political goal and some sort of feeling of freedom and democracy. And that was very successful. So I think that if we are united, build broad majorities in nations, but also between like-minded countries. And I think most important is now that countries that feel that democracy is something good and freedom is something good, they keep together and that is also a very important signal, and then we can be the winners in the end of, of, of this. Also in a peaceful way, because if we build a, a threshold, a threshold that uh, holds back an antagonist, then we also can defend our values. But we can also maybe create the climate when we, then, when we see that we can solve the problems in a peaceful way because we also are strong. So it can be a way to be strong can also lead to peace. So and strong you can be in values, you can be it in, in military resources, you can be it in, in cooperation and you can be it in, in a political goal that you really fight for. 
So consensus can be many things. It can also be to fight, to have a, the platform of consensus. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. Thank you. And if you need to go, you just feel free. Mm. Yeah, we, we appreciate your participation. Uh, Mr. Joanna, coming back to uh, values and ability to protect yourself with the military forces. The NATO has uh, just great experience of dealing with different aspects of uh, peace and security stabilization. We're talking about the international stage, including Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, yes, sometimes painful experience. Uh, but having in mind this experience and having in mind that we have few uh, frozen conflicts in the Black Sea, what uh, uh, feelings and thoughts you have about how to better to stabilize uh, security here and what NATO else can do from the uh, view of, of protection of values of democracy? Listen, there is no better way in maintaining this consensus that the minister was referring to and adding on top of staying united as nations that believe in democracy and international norms. Stick together, be united, and never, never accept this kind of attitude in international affairs. But on top of that, I think that something that is already in the declaration that we have, that has been proposed today and endorsed by many, we have to prove to our own citizens, but also to the citizens from the other side, from occupied, illegally occupied Crimea, from the illegally temporary occupied eastern part of Ukraine, illegally occupied Transnistria, illegally occupied South Ossetia, illegally occupied Abkhazia, and any of those situations, that our system is better, that living in open society is better than to live in tyranny and totalitarianism, mm. that having political civilian control over your intelligence services is better than unchecked power on your citizens, mm -hmm. that living in democracy and sometimes being at odds with your opposition, people in your own country, is better than eliminating your political opponents mm. and putting them in jail or even worse. I cannot only encourage Ukraine to continue on the path of reforms domestically. In the defense sector that we are encouraging, we talked at length this morning, when it comes to intelligence services reform, but also to the broader economic, social, and democratic journey of your great nation. Results would show People who live better, already Ukraine has a GDP per capita higher than Russia's. My home country, Romania, before joining NATO, we had a GDP of roughly 70-something billion US dollars. 15 years after we joined NATO and the EU, my country has quadrupled this GDP. Quadrupled the GDP is 230 billion euros today. So I think the best way is for us to show our unwavering solidarity with the people and nation of Ukraine in its sovereign territory. To our friends in Georgia, to our friends in Moldova, stay the course, invest in this thing. But also you domestically, with our help, with our support, with our advice when it is needed, not preaching on you, not preaching on you, but being your loyal partners in the journey of choosing the West as a way of organizing your society. Stay that course, and results would follow. Your country becomes stronger, your people become prouder and more prosperous, all of us will be stronger together, and I have no doubt that the Bucharest summit decisions of 2008 
on eventual membership, and membership for Ukraine and Georgia will become a reality if we stay the course. We have to stay the course. We are here with you to stay the course and move forward. Promising words, and I hope also all Ukrainians will consider very seriously everything that's going on here. Mr. Danilov, uh, talking about the deoccupation, and uh, Ukraine just adopted the deoccupation strategy, which is great achievements, I think. But what, uh, where we should put the focus? Okay, talking about reforms, or what are the ways of deoccupation which Ukrainian authorities see as the most promising one? Well, to start with, I just wanted to say and just wanted to outline that this issue is a very complex issue and it's really hard for us to give uh, the ready-made answer to this question. I do not understand that if we will put it this way, then we will just trick ourselves into that. The world is very changing. The world is changing fastly. And there's a lot of events take place in the world and they will continuing as well uh, be influencing and impacting our country and all over the world. So speaking about deoccupying Crimea and speaking about restoring Crimea and Ukrainian sovereignty, we are sure that this will definitely happen. This is an issue of time. It's just that I say that we're not going to be waiting until 2036. We have to understand even during the occupation of Estonia and uh, the people of Baltic countries for 51 years have been stating their independence. It was a different situation in the world. Right now, the situation in the world is different. The speed of our existence is much faster. Faster. The events all over the world are much faster. The people have said that the events that currently take place in Afghanistan couldn't have been forecasted. It couldn't have been forecasted neither by NATO or any other country all over the world. It gives us the understanding there are some other issues we should consider because those events that take place right now, they're going to be the key important issues that will then reflect and will then impact other processes as well, concerning Russian Federation and other countries as well. There are multiple factors influencing Crimea. So there's not one single recipe that we can use and we can apply to deoccupying Crimea. First of all, we're using their political and diplomatical points of view and approaches. We try to resolve this issue in a diplomatic way. But I want to outline that and highlight that. If there's going to be a different approach used by other countries, then we're going to be ready to resolve those issues in a different way. I understand that sometimes it happens happens that there are some windows of opportunities. And when we have some windows of opportunities, we should use that. And trust us, we're going to use that if there's going to be this opportunity windows opened. What is the most important for us? Human life is the most important for us. At this very moment, our country has already lost 13,000 men and women, the defenders of our country. And I want to remind you that there was the very figure of the losses of the Soviet Union for the 10 years campaign in Afghanistan. No one will bring back the lives of that people. This is the most important thing that we have to talk about right now. That is important for Ukraine. It is important for the president. So. Restoring the integrity of Ukrainian territory, bringing Crimea back, is going to happen. In what way it's going to happen, it will depend. We have calculated multiple options, and together with our partners, we will hope that this is going to happen as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lanet, um, uh, Estonia has around 25% of population, of Russian-speaking population, which automatically makes it very, um, like, a, very weak to the disinformation, to hybrid influence, to influence operations. So having this experience, uh, do you think that you have some recipes of how to protect your population, how de they hypnotize them, let's say so, from the influence? And can uh, this experience be applied to Crimean population, which is fully isolated now from the information poll interview? Yes. Uh in Estonia, it's approximately uh, 32,000 Russian-speaking population, and uh, most of them are living uh, on the eastern part of Estonia and quite closer to the Russian border. What we have done in Estonia, uh, the first main question is that uh, 
do they trust Estonian state? And when they trust the Estonian state, uh, then the next question is why they trust the Estonian state? And probably the answer is quite simple, because they have better to live in Estonia than in Russia. Of course, it's uh, starting uh, from the education. How educated will be these people? Language. Do they speak the same language as we? And why they have to study, for example, Estonian language? The reason is why to study Estonian language, to reach better education, to be on the better positions on the labor market. And uh, the main thing is that they will have equal, equal possibilities to, to be on the development process. And uh, I think the quite good example shows that uh, they trust Estonian state if they would like to go to the army service. We, we have, uh, by the law, eight months and 11 months for the Estonian citizens who have to serve in the army. And uh, every year, the number of these people whose mother language is Russian language, the number of them is rising. And the uh, integration process in our army is very simple, but very good. And that shows that they would like to protect Estonia. Estonian soil, Estonian state, Estonian values, democra democra democracy. I just visited Iraq, where we, we have uh, our Estonian contingent. They are voluntary soldiers. They are not professionals. We have there more than 30 soldiers. And when we started to talk to them and how they are motivated and, and what they are feeling over there, the first hand what was raised, and person who said, I am only Russian here. I feel very well amongst my Estonian colleagues. And that shows that how much they are integrated to Estonian society. And um, the main thing to understand from these points is uh, question why, why they have to be in Estonia, why they would like to be part of Estonian society. And the simple answer is they have better life in Estonia. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Queen, um, I'd like uh, to come back to some like, uh, military yeah. actions, yeah. let's say so, more defense actions. Um, uh, lately, Ukrainian expert community ringing a bell about the Zmini Island, which was well accepted by Ukrainian authorities, and this is coming back to what Mr. Griska was said, that Ukrainian authorities pay attention and uh, visited uh, Zmini Island, which is a very strategic point in the Black Sea. Mm. Not only Ukraine, but for Romania and for the region in the whole. So, um, we try to uh, make that actions in advance uh, uh, further aggression of Russia, potential aggression of Russia to Zmini Island. But let's talk about your feeling. What would be reaction of international community and our key partners if uh, Russia starts uh, aggressive actions towards the Zmini Island, for example? And will we see some more rapid reaction than we saw in 2014? Did the situation change? Uh, well, firstly, uh, the, uh, the island in question, I know Mr. Anloff and, and the President have visited recently. Yes. Um, and clearly we are concerned, as we always are, about rumours of potential uh, Russian aggression. It's the type of thing that is monitored uh, very closely by ourselves and by our allies. And I'm afraid this is part of a continuum. So Russian activity, Russian threats have been ongoing since 2014. And as the NATO Deputy Secretary General said, it is incumbent on all of us to expose them and call them out whenever it happens. When that malign activity takes place, they must be called out, they must be exposed to what it is. And it's vital that we are all acting in practical ways uh, to support 
uh, Ukraine. Our UK training operation, Operation Orbital, uh, was the first on the ground here in Ukraine after uh, Russia's illegal annexation. It's trained, I'm proud to say, over 21,000 armed forces personnel to date, and its work continues, uh, as do our joint uh, operations on land uh, with the exercise joint endeavour commencing next week. And this is just one way in which the UK is providing that resilience, helping to build resilience uh, with our partners in Ukraine to deter uh, the activity of which you speak. Another is focused, very relevantly given the question, on a very comprehensive package of initiatives in the maritime domain. So last summer, uh, my colleague, the Defence Secretary, uh, and launched uh, the uh, Maritime Training Initiative here in the UK, working with, in Ukraine, working with uh, our colleagues. And building on that, there's a memorandum I signed with my opposite number uh, uh, a couple of months ago uh, on board HMS Defender. Uh, Mr. Danilov was there at the same time uh, to uh, set out our advanced plans to work together uh, with Ukraine in developing the capabilities of her Navy. All of this helps to build Ukraine's resilience and, deter and deterrence. And once again, we're not alone, uh, or far from it. On the maritime training, Canada and Denmark are with us and other NATO allies and other friends are providing a huge amount of wider training and support and resilience to Ukraine. And on deterrence, and again, the NATO De Deputy Secretary General mentioned this, we should put the Black Sea in context, not just the regular NATO maritime exercises that I referred to, uh, but also, as has been said, Operation Biloxi, based in Romania, but seeing NATO aircraft patrolling out into the Black Sea. Uh, and as has been mentioned, uh, aircraft currently doing that include Royal Air Force typhoons, and I look forward to seeing them, as do a number of us, I'm sure, at the fly past tomorrow to celebrate Independence Day. So, to summarise, Alina, there are a number of planks to help deter malign Russian activity. The ongoing reform and development of the Ukrainian armed forces, deepening resilience and capability, as has been referred, and ongoing efforts by NATO, the Ukraine, and Ukraine's many friends to help support that reform and wider uh, reform in the country to really make this proud nation even better into the future, as has been mentioned, and ensuring and this falls on all of us, that peace-loving nations with shared values make sure that the world never forgets, not least through this forum, that Russia's annexation is illegal and that Crimea yeah. is Ukraine. Thank you. Mr. Griska, you paid like a substantial part of your life to Russian studies. You know them. Uh, and. Uh, you know, their behavior, their mentality, I don't know. So uh, what mistakes Ukraine and our friends and partners should avoid and how we can make Russians go out from Crimea? Thank you, Alina. Very uh, important question. But my uh, answer will be very simple. We should stop believing Russian fairy tales. But if you will uh, went 30 kilometers from Moscow, in any region, we will see absolutely different country. Moscow, it is not Russia at all. It's only, uh, I would say, a uh, uh, very nice uh, picture of uh, not existing Russia. Uh, next point, uh, that the Russia could start nuclear war. It is also uh, not the case because uh, Russia and Russian regime don't want to die. The question is very simple. Uh, what for they have stolen billions of US dollars uh, in Russia uh, if they would like to die in the nuclear war? It is very banal. Uh, blackmail. Very unfortunately, in the West, people are still afraid that Russia can start these uh, uh, military actions. Uh, 
my understanding is that, uh, in fact, uh, the West, the collective West, uh, could change uh, Russian policy within four or five months by imposing a very strong and very uh, uh, targeted oriented uh, sanctions uh, in the field of economy. Uh, I do understand that uh, we should combine our efforts, uh, but uh, what is important in my view is that the Ukrainian uh, part of this civilized world is much more better prepared to understand Russian psychology. In this sense, uh, I would like to invite our Western uh, colleagues uh, not uh, to avoid this uh, opportunity to be with uh, Ukrainians in very close contact because we can really help better to understand what is going on in the Russian Federation. In such a way, our way to um, uh, prevent uh, the further aggressiveness of this country could be reached. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like uh, we come to finalization of our panel and we have just a few minutes for to, before the end. So each of you have like a 30 seconds to say not only the last words on this panel, but last words on official part of the Crimean platform and uh, give some prognosis of, of the future, which we will live tomorrow in. So let's start from Mr. Griska, but please, just like a 30 seconds each, and then come okay. to this way. Uh, probably, uh, as far as my understanding of the conclusions uh, we, can made, uh, we can make today, uh, having in mind uh, the first uh, results of this Crimean platform. Uh, in my view, uh, this platform uh, should uh, become part of the NATO's uh, Black Sea and Azov Sea strategy. Otherwise, uh, it could be only some kind of uh, very nice slogans, uh, but without any practical uh, uh, results. My second point is that the uh, uh, Crimean plat uh, platform should become a permanent platform with specific uh, plans of action in each uh, avenue which we are going to, um, to have. For example, economic dimension, uh, human rights, uh, of course, uh, uh, security and uh, defense, etc., etc. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will not move uh, ahead. My third point is that, uh, that all participants of this platform individually and collectively should uh, increase their pressure on the Russian Federation. It is one of the very important prerequisites uh, for changing Russian policy. Otherwise, if I will only express uh, concerns, great concerns, very great concerns, it will be the same uh, policy we are uh, eyewitnessing now. Thank you. And my son, uh, at my last point, uh, and it is in my view a very important one, that Ukraine should uh, show the leading role in this process, uh, having a Crimean question uh, on the very top of all international security for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Quinn. 30 seconds. Yeah. F tomorrow we celebrate 30 years of Ukrainian independence. And the message from this platform is very clear. And it's a message that we welcome. We must never accept Russian aggression or her illegal annexation. Clearly this matters to Ukraine, but it matters to every nation. We must be very clear that aggression will continue to be deterred and resisted, that Russia's malign behaviour will be called out at every turn, and we will not accept what is an illegal annexation. So on a positive note, Ukraine has many friends, friends who will help and support you, and I'm very proud that the UK will be at the forefront of that. Thank you. Ms. Larnett. 
I need just five seconds. <laughs> that means that how solidar we are, not only in words, and also in uh, real activities, actions, and time, how quickly we can make decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hulkswit. We must fight for the rule-based international order. We must always fight for democracy and freedom. Don't change position. Handle provocations and infiltration. This is a long-term commitment. Be united and be proud and stand up for the Crimean platform. Very good. Mr. Chairman. I'm thrilled that uh, in the Ukrainian public opinion, NATO is perceived positively by more than 50%. Keep your people committed to the Western direction for, for this great country. Stay the course of reform. Not one piece of reform for NATO accession, not another one for EU accession, not another one for the IMF, whatever. One coherent strategy together. And the Western direction is something that I know will bear results, including in the rightful fight of your nation for full control of your sovereignty, of your territory. So congratulations, Ukraine, on the 30th anniversary of your independence. Together, we'll stay the course. Thank you. So this is a historical day today. This day will uh, be carved in stone, will be carved in the, the stone of history of Ukraine. And I'm really grateful to all international guests visiting our capital. And I really, I, I'm really thrilled. I'm, I'm admiring what you all are doing. And uh, Ukraine is above all. And everything will work for Ukraine in its best way. So. Happy Independence Day. Тож, я дуже дякую гостям нашої панелі. І я, як завершальне слово, хотіла би сказати, що всім людям, які чують нас в Криму, ми з вами, а ми лишаємося бути єдиною країною, незалежно від того, які зараз обставини складаються. І з вами не лише Україна, з вами весь демократичний світ. Тому ми не просто віримо, ми знаємо, що ми побачимо, де окупований Крим, в якому нам буде приємно жити, працювати, і який буде знову частиною демократичної України. Дякую всім, хто дожив до кінця цієї сесії. Дякую.